Today in Mackie Tech, we're going to be talking about virtual machines, or VMs for short. We'll talk about their usage cases, their benefits, how they work, but we're not going to get too technical. We're not going to talk about containers, which are essentially like a virtual machine's little brother, but we will give you enough information that you will be dangerous. So stay tuned. The best way to describe a virtual machine is to imagine that you're running your Mac and you're able to run a version of Microsoft Windows in a window like you would a web browser or another application just as seamlessly. The Mac runs the VM with the help of an application called a hypervisor, such as VirtualBox, by allocating portions of the Mac OS's RAM, storage, and CPU to the VM of Windows. Within the virtual machine of Windows, you can hypothetically run most any Windows applications as if you were on a Windows-only computer, which is a huge benefit. But you're going to sacrifice some speed and efficiency because the virtual machine of Windows is taking up some of the Mac's resources. The benefits of this are that you can now run Windows applications on your Mac without having to go out and buy a Windows-based computer. So compatibility is one benefit Run your Windows machine. Also, you can use it for testing purposes. So if you wanted to test out a distribution of Linux before committing to it, you can certainly use it for those purposes. But another benefit is not only running one or two VMs, but running several virtual machines simultaneously. VirtualBox is a type two hypervisor, meaning it needs to run on top of another operating system like Mac, Windows, or Linux in order to function. It's also extremely user-friendly and ideal for beginners who want to run one, maybe two virtual machines simultaneously on their home computer. So let's spin up a virtual machine of Windows within VirtualBox on Windows and see how it works. Okay, so here we are on my VirtualBox. You can see that I have a previously installed version of Windows 11. So if we're going to start another one, we're going to go up to the new button here and click on that. And then we'll give it a name different from our other one. So we'll say Windows 11a. And you can see that it's already defaulted the type to Windows. Of course, I can change that if I want to. I have Linux, I have Solaris, I have Mac OS. I have a couple of ones I can monkey with if I want to, but we're going to leave it at Windows. And you can see that it's using the Windows 11 64-bit, which is what I installed before. And if I click down where it says ISO image, you can see that it is saved right here from where I did it before. And I will put a link in the downloads of where to get the Windows 10 as well as Windows 11 ISO images. And you can see also here we have a couple different options of unintended install where you can actually put in the Windows product key. You can set up a user and password if you want to. Now, we're not going to do this, but as an aside, you don't need a Windows 10, 11 product key in order to install or even use Windows. You can use it just for testing purposes, but if you want to customize it in any way, you should probably activate it and purchase a product key. Under unintended install, which we're not going to do, we have hardware. And these are defaults that it already set up for us. I didn't do any of this. You can see the base memory here is four gigabytes, which is a little low. That's bare minimum for Windows 11. I would probably recommend bumping that up to at least eight uh, if you do have the resources. And the processor is it gives us a two, which is fine. If I click on hard drive, it's given us 80 gigabytes, which is more than enough. And everything else here, I'm just going to leave as default. So we're going to leave the RAM at 4 because it's just for demonstration purposes. It'll be fine. But if you do want to use anything besides a, a web browser in your virtual machine of Windows, I would recommend putting 8 gigabytes on there. So let's go ahead and click on Finish. And you can see that it's already started up. You can see up right. I know oh, you missed it. It's powering up. And this window is going to pop up here. Make that a little bigger if I can. And I'm going to put my mouse in here just so I can capture it. Now that prompt was asking me to press any key to boot from CD or DVD. So you want to make sure that you're clicking your keyboard. This is because the Windows installer thinks you're installing from a physical CD or DVD, but you're really just emulating one. Okay, so it's asking us for a product key right away. I'm going to say I don't have a product key. And then it's going to go ahead and we're getting things ready. So it's going to go ahead and install. Okay, installing Windows 11. 
Okay, so we can see that the Windows has rebooted and we have finished with the installation. And as you may or may not have heard, we also have sound. We have access to all of the same items as a normal Windows installation. We have our desktop here. We have internet access with our browser. And you can see we have our network access already set up. And if we go up to the top left here, you can see that we have access to all the different uh, machine settings, we have access to all of our devices, all of our USB is all here. Uh, we have shared folders, we have audio as we saw before. Uh, we talked about network. We can change the resolution if you want to. We can make the display bigger. We have access to resolution settings. We can make the image bigger. We can change the wallpaper. Now, just as a, as a point of reference, if we were to minimize this, and we do, we, let's take a look at our task manager. And in our task manager here, we can see that VirtualBox virtual machine. And it's running about 4,200 megabytes or about 4.2 gigabytes, which is a, the same amount of RAM that we allocated to that Windows virtual machine. And this machine that I'm using is a Minus Forum 890 Pro, and it has 32 gigabytes of RAM. As I mentioned, I could probably run uh, one, two, maybe three virtual machines of Windows simultaneously and do it comfortably. But if I wanted to run more virtual machines simultaneously, like eight to 10, you would probably want to consider getting a type one hypervisor. And we'll talk about that next. Unlike type two hypervisors like VirtualBox, type one hypervisors don't need an operating system like Windows or Mac in order to run. You install them as their own operating system on your computer's bare hardware, hence the term running on bare metal. Examples of Type 1 hypervisors are RAID, TrueNAS Scale, Proxmox, and Windows Hyper-V, to name a few. You'll find them mostly in home labs like mine and many other YouTubers, as well as small, medium business environments, home offices, that type of thing. Now, I did a video on my home lab, which is running Proxmox over the summer, which I will link in the description. But my server has 64 gigabytes of DDR4 RAM and is running a AMD 3251 eight core processor. So it's really not anything that crazy. But let's take a look at how Proxmox works with different VMs, how it runs them all simultaneously, and how it utilizes memory and how it's different than VirtualBox. So let's take a peek at Proxmox. You can see that I have about eight different virtual machines running right now. But I have one for Home Assistant, I have one for Open Media Vault, I have a couple of web servers on here, I have a Zorin OS virtual machine, I have a Windows 10, and as I mentioned, I have a Windows Server 2022, and I have a NextCloud virtual machine. So about eight that are running currently. So this is what they look like if they're all opened up simultaneously. I'll start that one again, that's my server one. This is my other, my Windows one. But it's getting a little crowded in here. There's another web server one. I have like two or three different web servers that I'm running. My Open Media Vault, which is here, it actually opens as a its own web browser. That's Windows Server still booting up here. Here is my Open Media Vault instance. If I click on our tab and I go to my Home Assistant, there is my Home Assistant. So that is all. These are all installed on my Proxmox Home Lab. If we go back to Proxmox, let's go over to our main server node here and look at the summary. This is a 64 gigabyte server that I'm running. Right now, 70% uh, of the RAM is being utilized for these eight virtual machines that are running simultaneously. And this server is barely breaking a sweat. The CPU usage is at, was it 14.4, 14.5? Granted, they're just open, they're just sitting there, they're not doing anything, but the CPU is barely breaking a sweat with all eight of them just kind of open and idle. Now this is by no means a, a lot of virtual machines on Proxmox. I'm barely scratching the surface. But what if you're a small business trying to run eight separate physical computers for each of these operating systems? That's thousands of dollars in computer hardware, not to mention the maintenance, the upkeep, the electric bills, the additional heat it generates. All of that is going to add up. And, you know, to clarify, I did spend about $2,000 on this specific home lab, 
but you don't need to spend that much to run a number of different virtual machines on Proxmox. You can get away with spending probably 500 and less to get a nice little machine to run four, five, six, seven, eight virtual machines. Now, with respect to installing a virtual machine on Proxmox, I have done a video of that in the past that I will link in the description, but it's essentially very similar to doing it on VirtualBox. It's the same idea. You have options for the operating system here. You tell it which ISO image you want to use. You assign it RAM resources, CPU resources, disk storage. The Proxmox, you can get a lot more granular, a lot more customizable with Proxmox. Now I could spend two or three or four different videos showing you all the different ins and outs of Proxmox and all the ways to customize it and the different types of VMs you can boot up with, all the different types of storage and backup, ISOs you can store and tasks and backup history. And But I think for today we're going to leave it there as just wanted to show you the benefits of using VirtualBox uh, next to Proxmox and you can see the differences. I hope this video gave you some starting knowledge as to how virtual machines work, their benefits, their cost-saving benefits, as well as a lot of their conveniences and how you can work them into your daily workflow. But I'm also curious as to your thoughts. What are you guys using currently as your hypervisors or are you running certain virtual machines? Obviously we didn't talk about containers today, but I would be interested to see what type of containers you're running also and what hypervisors you're using for that. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to Mackie Tech and leave me all of your thoughts and constructive criticism in the comments. And I hopefully will be talking to you again very soon. Thanks again for watching.